I asked Martin a long, long time ago if I could do these two sermons. Who is Jesus and who am I in Jesus next week? And when I started to prepare, I just came to a blank. And then Wendy had her word. Do you remember her word about her cataracts being removed? And she could, she could see the birds on her bird table. One minute, I'm hanging this up. Come and help me out, Martin. Okay, hang on, hang on. I said, okay. And I realise that I'd got a sin in my life. That's why I wasn't being able to get on with this. And so I got that put right with God. Can I encourage you, if if anybody speaks to you, to come up, if it's not too personal, to come up and give testimony. I think one thing we're lacking is testimony. Testimony always gives me faith. It always blesses me. And then, I'm coming and going, and then um, it was all muddled up. So I came to church and asked Emmanuel to pray and then it all came together. Praise the Lord. The Gospel of John, chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing has been made. In him was and that, am I coming and going, John? Yeah. I am coming and going, aren't I? Yeah. Shall I carry on? <laughs> In him was life, and that life was the light of mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And later on, no one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son, who is himself God, and is in the closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. You know, the Holy Trinity has dwelt together for eternity backwards, and will dwell together for eternity forwards. That's for us, we just cannot really comprehend. That's too big. But they have dwelt in harmony for all eternity. The God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, the three in one. And it says there, through him all things were made. Now I fully recognise Christians have difficulty. I've got to face this way. If I go that way, <laughs> my apologies to you over there. <laughs> if some people have difficulty with the creation, but the creation is mentioned right the way through the Bible that God created the world. There was a lad called Jack, and Jack's mother brought Jack up as a Christian and uh, told him about how God created the world. But Jack's father did not agree with this. So when, Jack's, when Jack was old enough, Jack's father told him what he thought was a true story. This totally confused Jack. So Jack went back to his mum and said, Mom, you told me the world was created in six days. Father said they came from monkeys. Mum was very quick-witted and she said, yes, that's the, your father's side of the family. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, we all know the story that God created this world, the Holy Trinity created this world in creating man and woman with free will 
And he knew that the Holy Trinity knew what was going to happen. And that Adam and Eve sinned. And that God, our Father, cannot stand in the presence of sin. It is impossible for God the Father to stand in the presence of sin. So, Adam and Eve were put out of the garden. And the plan had to come how we were going to be put back into touch with God. You know, to understand the New Testament, I really believe we have to understand the Old Testament as well. The two go together. We can't read just the New Testament. We have to read the two together. And through the Old Testament, there are over 300 prophetic words about the coming of Jesus, his life and his ministry, his death and his resurrection. And it says clearly that Jesus would be of the lineage of King David. And he would be born by Mary through the lineage of King David. And King David then could trace his line back to Adam. So we have the first Adam who sinned and then the second Adam in Jesus. What did Jesus look like? You know, I have never yet seen a portrait. Hello? We've gone again. <laughs> right. Okay. I have never yet seen a portrait that, for me, would look anything like Jesus. You know, when we were in Sri Lanka, I got talking to a so-called educated Buddhist, and he said they were the only religion to have an image of their founder. I thought at the time he should have probably gone on a bit of a diet. But, but I said to this man, I said to this man, as a Christian, I have the presence of Jesus within me. I have the Holy Spirit within me. And his face fell. He couldn't answer that. But what did Jesus look like? He was not the glamorous European fair, glossy, uh, blonde-haired man, as every artist seems. And he didn't have a halo. <laughs> no, he didn't have a halo. This might shock you. This, this is one of those prophecies. This might shock you. It says in Isaiah 53, verse 2, He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. Isn't that amazing? Nothing in his appearance. Because Jesus didn't need the appearance of a film star. Jesus didn't need that because the light that shone out of him, that's what attracted people to him. Not his facial features, it's what shot out of him. And then there's that famous prophecy which we read every Christmas and rightly so. For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. And this is the bit. This is the bit. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish it. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this.
And of course, he would be born of a virgin. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. You know, we see many Catholic churches are St. Mary to the Immaculate Conception. How about that for the name of a church? <laughs> But you know, they are absolutely right. Mary did have an immaculate conception. She was a virgin. And the very seed of God came down into her womb. And you know, the timing of Jesus' birth had to be to the very minute of the right time. Because at that time, it had to be the right spiritual things happening in the country. It had to be in the world. It had to be the right political things happening in the world. It had to be perfect timing. And there we see Mary and Joseph. And Mary almost fully on term, in turn. But they're in the wrong place. They're in Nazareth. They shouldn't be in Nazareth. They should be in Bethlehem. But there we were, and I bet, I bet Joseph being a carpenter made the best crib. Can you imagine this couple with the responsibility that to Mary was going to be born the Messiah? The responsibility on them. And right at the last minute, an edict comes how God put this. And what he did, the str strongest man in the world, well, so he thought at that time, was Caesar Augustus in Rome, in Italy. He writes an edict. And that edict comes down to the local governor and eventually it reached Nazareth that this couple have got to go to Bethlehem. Right at the end of Mary's pregnancy. It's a three day journey. And she had to go that three day journey to Bethlehem. But you know, everything was all right because the zeal of the Lord Almighty was going to accomplish this. Hallelujah. And she got there. And there, perfect timing that the star was shining above Bethlehem. The shepherds heard the best choral music ever produced. And the Messiah was born. And you know when Messiah was born, taking Trevor's, what Trevor said this morning, you know there was only two people ready for when he was born. Simeon and Anna. Only two people that we've got record of that were praying um, for the Messiah to come. You know, it was impossible for the theologians in the Old Testament to say how this birth was going to take place. Because over here, yes, he was going to be born in Bethlehem. Over here, he was going to be a Nazarene. But over here, he was going to come out of Egypt. So if you were in the Old Testament, how are you going to put all this lot together? Well, he was born in Bethlehem, and then Herod was going to kill all the two-year-old children, men, babies. And so they had to flee to Egypt. And when Herod died, they came out of Egypt, and Jesus was raised in Nazareth. As a Nazarene. Isn't that fantastic? Each one came true. And throughout the Old Testament, God demanded a sin offering, a sin offering to be made. The first reference to this is Abraham. Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, father, Yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and the water are here, Isaac said. But where is the lamb for the burnt offering? 
Now this is a prophetic word right at the beginning. Abraham answered him, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. God himself would provide the lamb. And that was right for that, case, for that time. And it was right in the future. God would provide the lamb. And that's why John the Baptist, when he saw his cousin Jesus coming to the River Jordan, John the Baptist called out, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Behold the Lamb of God. The Lamb of God had come to take away the sins of the world. You know, right away through his life, Jesus totally relied on the unbelievable, you know, I knew I was going to have trouble with this word. <laughs> umbilical, umbilical, umbilical call, umbilical, thank you, umbilical call, going from him. You see, the Holy Trinity was still in practice. It was still working. There was Jesus, totally man, totally reliant on his Father and the Holy Spirit coming up and down. You know, when Jesus was 12 years old, at 12, he would have had his bar mitzvah by then. At the age of 12, Jesus was then declared a man. He was totally responsible for his own actions at the age of 12. And he gets left behind at the Passover in the temple in Jerusalem. And it's amazing, at the age of 12, because up to all those years, to the age of 12, there's that line going back to his father. And you know what they said? The teachers of God, these are the highest teachers of the land. These are the most intelligent men in the land. These are the creme de creme of the land. And he said, everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and answers. Everyone who heard him were amazed because he'd spent his youth feeding from his father in heaven. And at the age of 12, everyone was amazed. And as we all know, that ministry started when Jesus was 30 years old, uh, for only three years. Three years. And everything he did came from his father. That's why Jesus had to so often go and pray and to be alone. And if you sum up his three years ministry, you can put it like miracles, morality and message. Miracles, morality and message. And his miracles were amazing. He touched so many people. So many people were healed. So many people were touched by Jesus. And you know, when Jesus healed people, it wasn't factory production, you know, like this. He took each one as an individual. Each one was an individual person. And each one got healed in a different way. And of course, the feeding of 5,000 people. Is it all right? Does it say it was just men? That was the people? I'm having a nod from the pastor. <laughs> that was just the men. The women and kids weren't there. You know, uh, sorry, weren't counted in the 5,000. Amazing. Amazing miracle. And we can think, people may think, that it was these miracles that attracted the thousands of people to him. Well, that is true but not totally true. 
and there is morality. Jesus had, was totally spotless. He was the spotless Lamb of God. He never sinned. And he had this group called the Pharisees. Now the Pharisees had grown and grown and were very, very influential at the time of Jesus. And this is the group that Jesus really, really spoke against. He called them the brood of vipers. Now, when I was living in Sri Lanka, I was living for a year in the jungle with lots and lots of snakes. I've got no fear of snakes, but there was one snake we always had to fear because all the other snakes wouldn't attack you unless, you know, you cornered them. But the viper, the viper was there waiting for you. The viper was there ready to go for you. And he called this group of Pharisees, you brood of vipers. Because what these men did, they took the law of Moses and added and added and added to it. And they were putting a massive millstone round their necks, round the people's necks. They were putting them in spiritual prison. And Jesus spoke out against this. In Acts chapter 10, verse 38, you know how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil, because God was with him. There we go again. God was with him. He relied totally upon his father. And as far as morality goes, the Sermon on the Mount is, I, I believe, counted right round the world as the highest moral teaching that we can have. The Sermon on the Mount is the highest moral teaching that we can have. And then we come to his message. And you know, it was his teaching, as well as his miracles, his teaching attracted thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people. Because his teaching was going just the opposite <coughs> way to what the, uh, the Pharisees were saying. Jesus' teaching was proclaiming freedom, proclaiming love, proclaiming righteousness. And this we, we cannot, in our culture today, we cannot see how radical the teaching of Jesus would have been. Absolutely radical. It says in John 7 verse 6, Jesus answered, My teaching is not my own. It comes from the one who sent me. It comes by the one who sent me. It's not his own. It comes by the one who sent me. And then he did an amazing thing. Jesus took on the very name of God. Because when Moses approached the burning bush to get his commission to go and free the people of Egypt, and Moses said to God at the burning bush, Who shall I say has sent me? And God replied, Tell the people, I am has sent you. And Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Everything he did pointed people to a new way. Everything he did brought life instead of death. Everything he did brought life. I am the bread of life. 
I am the light of the world. I am the gate for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the true Father, and also I and the Father are one. You know, Jesus had in his life five recorded assassination attempts upon his life, but it was not the time, and he escaped each assassination attempt. And, you know, the disciples had to recognise before Jesus died, they had to recognise that he was the Messiah. And Jesus asked Peter, who do people say that I am? And Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Martha, the sister of Lazarus and Mary. Martha replied, Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is come into the world. Hallelujah. They're getting the message. Now it came to pass when the time had come for him to be received up that he steadfastly set his face towards Jerusalem. He steadfastly set his face towards Jerusalem. The timing had come for that sacrifice. And it had to be at Passover. That's when it was, at Passover. When, when the Israelites were freed from 400 years of bondage in Egypt. Do you remember all the plagues? And the last plague was the angel of death was going to kill every firstborn son. And the Israelites were instructed to do what? To kill a lamb. Here we go again, a lamb must die. And they had to put the blood of the lamb round the door lintel. And that night the angel of death came by. And every Egyptian firstborn son, including Pharaoh's son, died. But not one Israeli son died that night. And so Jesus set his face to go to Jerusalem. And it had to be for the festival of Passover. That's when it had to be. That was the perfect timing. And he came before Caiaphas. And the high priest said to him, I charge you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. You have said so, Jesus replied. But I say to you all, from now on, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, He has spoken blasphemy. Why do we need any more witness? Look now, you have heard the blasphemy. And in the eyes of Caiaphas, the high priest, that's exactly what Jesus had spoken. And the high priest, he was there all in his, his best rig out, his best robe, and he rent his robe because the high priest had never heard such blasphemy. But Jesus was telling the truth. Jesus only told the truth. And they handed him over to Pilate. They, the Romans couldn't crucify anybody with a, with a blasphemy. So they hold, handed him over to Pilate with totally false charges that Jesus was the king of the Jews. And he was flogged. You know, as one scripture says, his back was like a ploughed field put the crown of thorns on his head 
He carried the cross as far as he could. He experienced the agony of the crucifixion. I didn't know, you know, sometimes it could take up to a week for a man, a strong man, to die on the cross. Up to a week. Jesus was on the cross for six hours. And his agony came, his biggest agony, because he was taking on the sins of the whole world. And the sky went absolutely pitch black. The sins of the whole world were so great, the sky went pitch black. And his biggest agony was come. The first time in eternity backwards or eternity forwards, the first time the unity was separated because Jesus was carrying the sin of the whole world. God had to turn his back. God the Father had to turn his back upon his son. And that unity was broken. And Jesus cries out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And then he says, this is from Psalms, this is, I, I, I was told, but I found no evidence of it, but I was told this, I, that these words were the words of a, a Jewish child would pray before going to bed every night. Now, that I, I looked and looked, I've got no proof of that. But Jesus said, into your hands I give my spirit. And then he said, the three most important words that have ever been spoken in this world from the beginning to the end. In my opinion, the three most important words that have ever been spoken. He said, it is finished. Yes, the Lamb of God had come and taken away the sins of the world. It is finished. It is finished. My sin, your sin. If we repent of our sin, like I had to before I started this, I had to repent of my sin. Isn't that wonderful that no Christian should ever be carrying guilt? If they repent of their sin, no Christian should ever have to carry guilt. Just realised I missed out a really good bit. <laughs> And it doesn't matter. And then, of course, he was put in the tomb, and we have the resurrection. And during the 40 days after his resurrection, over 500 people saw Jesus. And in 1 Peter, chapter 1, verse 3 and 5, Praise be to God, the, um, uh, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope. Just the opposite to what the Pharisees were saying. Now, we've got a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade. This inheritance is kept for you in heaven, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. Jesus ascended into heaven. Roger spoke this verse last week, and I feel so inadequate saying, who is Jesus in this short time? But you know, so did Jesus' closest, closest disciple, John. He couldn't, in the gospel, 
He couldn't get it down. Jesus, Jesus did many other things as well. And this is in three years. Okay, three years. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. So, there we have it. Next week, we'll look at who am I in Christ. Beck, could you put up the Apostles' Creed, please? When the church began, right from the beginning, there was those who started to infiltrate the church and what they were doing each time, the same as the Jehovah's Witnesses or the Mormons, what they were doing was decreasing the Jesus' name. And all the time, these, these people were coming into the church trying to defile the name and the glory of Jesus. And it's still happening today. And this is what we call the Apostles' Creed. And when we come to a bit we say, I believe in the Holy Catholic Church, that's nothing to do with a Pope in Rome. That bit means we are part of the universal church of this world. We are just a little tiny part of the universal church. I would rather like it if we could stand and together say the Apostles' Creed. And then we're really going to get it into our hearts and minds because then we're going to sing it. So we're going to have a double whammy. <laughs> I believe in God, the Father Almighty, who is the creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, given birth by the Virgin Mary, and suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose from the dead, ascended into heaven, and is seated at the Father's right hand. He will return to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and in everlasting life. Amen.